Well, hello, I'm Don Campbell, author of The Mozart Effect and 17 other books about music, sound, education, and transformation. I started out as a young kid in San Antonio, Texas, who was just in love with music. Every aspect of my life was nurtured by my parents' love for music, but it was not overly sophisticated. And after years of hearing my father play everything from the piano to the harmonica to the accordion, and I was studying piano and singing in the church choir, I had a magical event happen to me at age 13. My father got a job in Paris, and I became a student of Nadia Boulanger at the American Conservatory of Music. And at that moment, everything sharpened and clarified because I was actually able to hear some of the greatest musicians of Bernstein and Yehudi Menuhin. And I was just the South Texas young boy who suddenly became stunned with the power of sound and the power of art to transform attention, consciousness, and everything in the world. My path took me to uh, University of North Texas to study organ and education and music. Then it took me to Cincinnati Conservatory for graduate studies in conducting. And the next thing I knew, I was in Haiti, playing the organ at the cathedral, but also working in the hospitals. And there I began to see the power of the drum, the power of indigenous chant. And I looked at my watch and it was 1970 and the world had exploded and I ended up in Tokyo. On my way to India forever, but I stayed in Japan seven years and taught music to children and adults from 60 different countries. And I began to get a different intuition of what it was in the fabric of great music. Not only the art, not only the entertainment, but the ability to use sound and the specific ingenuity that music had to transform language to transform attentiveness and to allow communication between people who did not have a common language or even a common belief, politically or religiously. After years in Japan, I returned to Texas and I found in my earliest research there that the brain could talk to itself. The jargon in those years was right and left brain. But then as attentiveness and as research continued, we began to realize that the limbic system, the middle of the brain, had an emotional rapport to it, and that the whole nervous system and the autonomic system and the whole breathing systems all had rhythmic qualities and tonal qualities. And always being what I hope I can always say, a good classical musician. I found myself intrigued. It was as if going from a small room with a large orchestra to going to a universe with a voice. And being able to actually find that music is much more than what meets the ear. I began in the 19 early 80s to really ask what are the main questions that would be of interest to the public at large, to teachers and to parents. I wrote a wonderful little book in 1983 called Introduction to the Musical Brain that just gave an easy way for teachers to look at the dynamic, the intellectual, the cognitive aspects of how music is usable, and also then the effective, the improvisational, the play, the tonal aspects. And that book, which is now many, many years old, has lived and lived and inspired many people, and I continue to look at it for creative inspiration. I began meeting people I began to have the opportunity to perform and to compose. And my basic core is that of, of being a teacher. And perhaps maybe in this field of sound and therapy and uh, kind of a universal use of what uh, the rhythms and the sounds and the language are about, I, I think I'm really quite a missionary and that my job has been for a long time 
to find ways to translate, find ways to language, interesting things that are not necessarily esoteric are too clinical. I like to be able, as on my website, MozartEffect.com, is to give people resources so they can go to the dynamic research and who's doing the best job in it. That they can go to the aesthetic aspect of how do I learn to improvise? How do I just put this together in my life and I don't have any musical uh, background? And so I'm always looking at ways to find the translation of this incredible research into the application of how people can use music to improve their life day after day, how they can improve the stress in their families, how they can activate their children to want to develop better in language, and how also they can inspire their own heart. I'm not one that advocates sound and music all the time. Silence, quiet, natural beauty are as important in this sound diet as anything else. But here I am now at quite another level in my career and looking at how one book, The Mozart Effect, is now in 25 languages. It's, I've had the opportunity to go to over 40 countries and to help people listen better. It's not about put on a CD and get smart or put on a CD and you're instantly healed. It's about how do we change the mechanism of the approach to sound. How do we change ourselves when we go to a concert? How do we change ourselves and tune up our mind-body when we go to the hospital? How do we change the way we listen to the music we already like? And my great mentor in this was Dr. Alfred Tomatis, who said, listening is never hearing. Listening is your balance. Listening is your world. It is your ear, up and down, left and right, forward and back. The whole vestibular axis of your way to embrace the world is about refining the way you listen. So my path is, in a way, a researcher, but not in the clinical context. I'm always looking for new ways to envelope and invite people to listen to excellent quality music and not be overwhelmed. Well, my, my curiosity in the effect of Mozart began when I was 14 years old, when I went to Mozart's home in Salzburg and had the opportunity to play one of his instruments. And started listening to recordings of saying, well, isn't this just amazing that a teenager could do this? It wasn't until many years later, after listening to Mozart, after also uh, being very ill with an inch and a half blood clot on the right side behind my eye, that I started looking at using music in a way a bit different from just listen to this and heal, or just have the intention and heal, but to really be very solid, what is it within the components of music that help structure our time, space, experience within the form of music itself? And I began to realize, once I met Dr. Alfred Tomatis in the early 1980s, who was saying Mozart has the structure that allows the brain to do what it knows to do in the best way. Whether that's a sonata allegro form or whether it's a, a variation, but the high frequencies of Mozart as they stimulate the bone and the ear actually can modify the way we attend to this world. That it can improve speech. It can help us move out of our old un unconscious ways of of being present in this world. Well, that got my attention. I wasn't immediately sold on it until I started visiting centers throughout the world. And in these listening centers, I learned about what Dr. Tomatis had done and started in 1958 as he worked with children who had no ability to speak and who were what we might call today ADHD or forms of autistic that he found that by this auditory stimulation of very, very structured formed music, without words, 
without all the low sounds. In other words, he kind of filtered it, just like juice, you know. There was um, no fiber in these performances of Mozart. And the results were quite astonishing. And I began going to centers in, uh, in Canada and in Europe and in the United States. They were just beginning. And I saw the results. It wasn't until the 1990s that there was other research uh, from the University of California in Irvine that suggested that IQ could be boosted momentarily through the listening of Mozart. Well, all of this is very, very interesting, but what is interesting for me is that Mozart is much more than just a few pieces of music. And in my book, I was able to bring in all of my interests and in fine language to say, why is it that bossa nova is so interesting to the brain and the body? Why is it that this new ambient music, sometimes called new age or spacious music or um, uh, more environmental music, why is it that it actually affects our bodies and our brain? I was able to introduce the uses of music in education for teaching foreign language. I was able to talk about the wonderful people who are working in hospice with music to help that transitional stage. And more than anything, I was able to learn and to meet people and to really develop a good background in how important quality music is movement in early, early childhood. And in the first six years of life, the patterning, the structure, the rhythm, the ability by which one can integrate sound and literally get here. So much of a lot of the sound healing movement has been about getting there going to another phase, going to a higher consciousness, going away, uh, reducing the pain, all of that is so important. But the wonderful thing about the Mozart effect, it's really about how do we get here? How do we learn to listen? How do we work and attend? And how do we watch the body as it changes through attentive, conscious listening? This is just beginning. And the wonderful thing about it is I have the opportunity every summer to work with the Boston Symphony Orchestra at Tanglewood to do a whole weekend on conscious listening with the Institute of Consciousness and Music at Kripalu. I'm working with symphony orchestras all over the country to change the way that the audiences come to the concert so that they can get more from it, from their evening that they're investing. And then what inspires me even more is having been able to go into over 70,000 homes in Colorado and have volunteers through Bright Beginnings hand deliver a Mozart CD to young parents, single parents, and parents of multiple ethnic backgrounds on how to use music to help their child sleep, play, and reduce stress in their home. These are so important because it's not about going to a higher place. It's going to bring that height to the depth so that the very foundation called the art of music can surround us. Bringing the best quality music to the center of our social being is what I have taken on as the Mozart effect. Mr. Mozart was just a universal channel. He just wanted time to write down all the music coming to him. The real Mozart effect is how do we find time to do all the positive things, to bring beauty to our lives, those around us, with clarity and concise expression and joy. What we have discovered and are consistently researching is that music affects the heartbeat, the pulse, the brain waves, the skin temperature, the muscle tension. And that when we're in a heightened state of listening, our bodies respond more quickly. And this kind of entrainment means that we can move closer together in how we would offer music and bring music back to us as an offering to ourselves. Literally, the healing aspects of music 
perhaps are very different from the curative aspects of it. Being able to use music as a tool in a specific uh, curation process is really being done by music therapists and being done by massage therapists and people who are very clinically trained even in the holistic arts of acupuncture and massage there I mean there's a, a wide array of ways that music can be used to help the relaxation so the body itself unfolds in its own natural healing context but I took a challenge about f three years ago when a friend of mine said, Don, we need to go into hospitals and find a new way to set up a fuller environment by which the healing can exist. My friend, who is an interior designer in healthcare facilities, kept saying there is just one thing missing and that is the music. We need to do acoustic design. Would you like to help me explore? As a result, two and a half years ago, Aesthetic Audio Systems was founded in San Diego. And now we have nearly a dozen hospitals, healthcare units throughout the United States who are using multiple levels of programming to invite a better surrounding for wellness. We have a program for the emergency room for the outpatient waiting, for the surgical waiting, for the chapel, for outside hospitals, for the staff room, for the administrators. We have a different maternity program that is 24-7 based on selections. Right now we have over 4,500 selections that have been licensed and it's wonderful how Sounding of the Planet has played such a good part in this that we are able now to move as the times of the day. And as you look at wonderful old ancient music in India, they were aware every hour the whole different changes, the seasons of the year, the texture of the environment, and what is being asked of the moment. That is what I've asked myself. And literally, you will have in one room of a hospital, 20 minutes of Mozart, while at the same time there will be a shakuhachi playing in another place that's more, even more appropriate. We are designing health care so that there is a specific response to the acoustics of each individual room. Some rooms are so loud, music would only add clutter and it would be negative, no matter what we played. Too much. Other rooms are so dead that you have to be clear that you're using that color because everybody hears it so vividly. So my team at Aesthetics Audio, we are out there looking how we can create the ambience in healthcare, knowing that all of us can receive that tuning and that sense of beauty around us no matter where we are. I've always found the vibration of the breath and the body one of the most fascinating aspects of sound. Because the voice itself can release emotions, it can charge our brain, it can also give us a real sense of, re of relaxation. And I find it almost embarrassing at how powerful the voice can be in just bringing a shift in the mind, body, and our sense of how time and space passes. It was in the early 80s, before I had been published, um, I had quite a lump in my lung. And the doctor, who I liked so very much, was helping find out what was going on, was killed suddenly in a car accident. And I was really very sad. I had, my father had just passed away. And I found myself one evening just releasing my voice beyond the moan, the groan, the cry, the yell. It just exploded out of me. And I spent hours, hours, hours releasing my voice. It was a catharsis, and it was not very artistic. It... Uh, Fortunately, no one else was home, and I found myself just overwhelmed with grief and aggravation and frustration and almost um, 
feeling guilty because I always thought I had music to cure whatever I needed to cure. Well, the short of the story is there was no longer any cyst a few weeks after that. And I never want to imply through Mozart effect or through this that this is what you should do. It's only my story and I think it's what has motivated me to keep looking at why and how fine music and sound can be a part of everybody's life that does not necessarily uh, have to be a musician or have to be a therapist that art itself helps hold us and not be afraid to hear what our own voices are sounding. And even if you're a great singer, sometimes the moan and the groan is, is, is not always easy to make. And so I did write a, a few uh, books about it. One called The Roar of Silence, but I have a brand new book that has not been published called Creating Inner Harmony, and it's all my new ideas on the voice and sound and how everyone can even think certain sounds that help align the mind and the body. Um, my new book is with Hay House. I have one that just came out called The Harmony of Health. And these books have CDs in them, and I'm using very, very ancient uh, shapes and figures, known as tatvas, as a way to focus the visual attention while you are listening to auditory information and holding a thought. I'm really fortunate that I have the opportunity to work on multiple levels at all times. Uh, I'm ever busy. Uh, just this month I was in Austria, uh, Portland, San Francisco, and Japan. And I think there is an amazing reality to me that this work has just started. That people are more comfortable now than they were 20 years ago knowing that music can help them relax. That the medical community has a little stronger uh, curiosity about what they might be able to do with sound and music to help improve their patient's life. And I think there is some um, very mature skepticism about uh, sound and healing that we're able to do everything just with, with music. I believe that the arts and music are the handmaiden and that go hand in hand with both the clinical academic healers and the intuitive healers. And when we all become better listeners to the goals of what's going on around us, to the tools which we have that we're willing to give up or receive new, then we are really creating a world by which we are able to stay in balance. And that is my definition of harmony. Healing and harmony are not a place we ever get to. It's a state that every single day we work by movement, by what we hear, what we eat, how we feel. And some days are just not as much fun as others. And we have that opportunity to take even a wider buffet of great music and great sound, great inspiration to bring ourselves to a healthier, more harmonious state and as my father said, oh, I'm always going to li listen to the music I love because no matter what happens to me, I'll die with a smile on my face. And I think we can do that without any, any reservation. You know, there's no need to be intimidated if you don't play an instrument or if you don't sing. You may think someone told you, well, you have an out-of-tune voice or out of sync mind once in a while, but the whole body has rhythmic and musical qualities. And it's just wonderful to be able to feel free with the voice, whether you're traveling in an airplane, just humming into the frequency, or to be able to kind of be alone in nature and sing the songs that only your body really hears, and the cosmos. 
if you play an instrument, there are technical skills, the keyboard, that allows you to stimulate your brain in so many different ways because of the motor skills. When young children have the opportunity to skip and to dance and to move and to play and to listen and to sing, it is not a privilege. It is not an extra. It is not the icing on the cake. It is actually building the brain to communicate through movement, sound, and organize itself in such a different way that it has skills to do other things much better in life. Music does make you smarter. But it is not a matter of looking at just math skills or foreign language skills. It's about integration skills. Do we have ways to release our emotions so that they stay in that positive sphere of offering and of receiving? The only bad music in the world is the music that is ultrally so loud that it does damage to the ears, damage to the brain, and keeps you from utilizing your sound potential. So be not afraid of instruments. Remember that your teenager and playing that bass guitar may be releasing so much stress. It may be in the next room where you are, but there is a way by which we can realize that the making of music, the listening of music, and the body of music itself, married to silence, and quiet together helps give us a healthier world. The only thing I ask is please uh, in, in here uh, my website mozarteffect.com uh, if you haven't looked at it lately we have redone it all we have over 500 links to research and things that parents can do and students can do and um, it's the Mozart Effect Resource Center. There's a place for books and CDs, but the majority of the, the um, MozartEffect.com is about how you can find the areas of interest and improve yourself through them. As I often say to many groups, don't be afraid to go into your community. Offer to help at the Assisted Living Center for 30 minutes a week, and even if you just have paper plates or you bring some favorite CDs of oldies but goodies and play with them and sing with them, you can do something in your community. The churches are wonderful with wonderful music programs. And empower them with your light. Don't get stuck in how the world should be. Just improve it with the joy and the beauty and the sound that you are. Thanks so much. Welcome to my private sonic space that uh, is very rarely entered. We are so honored to be here. We are honored to be here. Thank you. Every morning I get up and I play hymns. And whether they be Methodist or Unitarian or Hindu or Gregorian, they fill my heart. And uh, my new age self has long left. I'm a middle aged self. And I just love the beauty of singing praise and joy and sorrow. And hymns hold the field. And then I can improvise and just hold whatever mood. After I play a hymn, after the beautiful poetry of a hymn and the beautiful resonance of form in a hymn, then I can let go and have that, that hymnody hold the foundation by which I let the Spirit just sing and feel and improvise. I'm so lucky to love sacred music from A to Z. And I'm writing a brand new book just right this moment called Sound Spirit, How Our Faith Makes Us Human. How it's not just to relax and let go, it's to be totally here and expand horizontally in the best way in the world 
that we can feel praise and peace and give what I call the confetti of joy to those around the world. It's really incredible to be seen and felt by the music community because I have tried to bring all together new ideas about music to the main line. The Boulder Philharmonic has invited me to give all their pre-concert lectures on music and consciousness. We are making that bridge and at the University of Colorado at the American Music Research Center, it's so exciting to see how we embrace the intuitive, the earth, the sky, the heaven, the classical, the clinical. All of them together at a table. Because nobody owns the field of music. Nobody was the pioneer. The first being who ever hit two sticks together and walked down that path. The first one who hummed. That's our ancestry of sound. It is not about who has the key for one little element of this work. And that I am seeing more and more as I continue to write. My new book is called Sound Spirit. As I continue to read oh, works about healing songs and working songs and continue to feel as I go to opera, classical, Darshan, and all kinds of world music. It's just here everywhere, the spirit of music. We can't push out anything. It's the power that allows us to be really human. I have a few things in my home that give me so much joy and empowerment. One was a gift from a friend of mine, a good friend of Alfred Tomatis of the Listening Center, but it is my original Chagall of Orpheus and Eurydice. Orpheus is our guide about going into the inner thought, the underworld, the mythos, the, the power of music to search for unity, to search for the beloved, and trying to lead from the darkness of this world into the light. And this is a marvelous Chagall that was commissioned by Prince Renair and Princess Grace of Monaco for Nadia Boulanger's 80th birthday. Nadia Boulanger was my teacher. She was my guru. I met her in 1960 when I was 13. And my very first book of 20 books was her biography. It's by far the best thing I've ever written and I've ever contributed. So that's my prized possession. Another possession is this wonderful organ. I love the multiple sounds and the beauty of how the organ raises the spirit. And since the 17th century, the organ has been a part of the evolution of sacred music in the West. Well, I wish I had a big pipe organ in my house, but I don't have room. But this is a very interesting instrument because it is tracker action and it is sampled from German and French instruments, so uh, it doesn't sound too bad. And I love the painting above it. This is the little town moret le sablon about 30 miles from Paris, near Fontainebleau, where I grew up in my high school years. And that's where I studied with Nadia Boulanger, and that's where I started studying organ. That piece is called Litanies, and it's about the prayers that are repeated in the Catholic Church over and over and over and over and over and over and over for the supplication of God's mercy upon the soul, that it be purged, cleansed, released, and feel the exquisite sense of joy forever. Yes. I love my wonderful old Victrola. <gasps> and if you're really nice to me, 
I'll play you the original recording of my singing at four years old. It's amazing. My father had this fantastic record maker in 1950 that he recorded my voice. And I just found these recordings not long ago. Age four. My first vocal recording, age four, 1950. Can you believe that pitch at that age? That you could find it. I could you know, find it. Yeah. I mean, I was listening. and it, you, you knew it, you weren't going to be able to do it right exactly, so you had to locate it, that. That's amazing. This out. has never been let out of this house. Oh. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's wonderful to invite you to my home in beautiful Boulder, Colorado. Thank you.